Hello and welcome to this uh, panel. Thank you to the Pearson Institute for hosting this very important and timely event. My name is Negar Murtazavi. I'm a journalist and political analyst based in Washington, D.C. I also host the Iran podcast. And um, in this panel today, we'll be discussing Iran, um, Iran's various foreign, regional, nuclear policy, as well as the country's domestic affairs. Um, I'm joined by an excellent group of panelists. They're all top experts in the field and really need no introduction, but I'll just briefly introduce the four of them. I'm joined by Mahsa Ruhi, a research fellow at the Center for Strategic Research at the Institute for National Strategic Studies at National Defense University. Um, next, we have Vali Nas, the Professor of International Affairs and Middle East Studies at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies and a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. We also have Pouya Ali Maram, a historian of the Middle East at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and author of Contesting the Iranian Revolution with Cambridge University Press. And last but not least, we have Ali Vaez, Director of Iran Project and a Senior Advisor to the President at Crisis Group and an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Um, we will be discussing a range of topics um, when it comes to Iran's nuclear negotiations with the United States and Europe, Iran's regional policy under the new administration, um, a little bit about Afghanistan after the U.S. withdrawal, how that relates to Iran and also Iran's domestic policies. And at the end of the session, there will be a 45 minute discussion uh, between me and the panelists, and then we'll be taking questions from the audience. So let me first start by um, the top headline really of the day, the current state of the nuclear negotiations. There have been a series of negotiations under the Biden administration and the previous administration in Iran, the Rouhani administration uh, conducted indirectly in Vienna. And now with a new admin, a new president and a new administration and a new team in Tehran, uh, mostly from the hardline faction of Iranian politics with Ebrahim Raisi himself being a conservative and um, the cabinet and the team and the negotiators that he's brought into place. Um, I'd like to first start with you, Ali, um, if you can give us the latest um, or the current really state of play when it comes to these nuclear negotiations. We were also hearing from Rob Malley, the U.S. Special Envoy to Iran uh, today about what the Biden administration is expecting from these negotiations. There were discussions of the follow-on uh, talks that President Biden has mentioned in the past and potentially um, also demands from the Iranian side on issues that are beyond the JCPOA um, uh, and the nuclear program. Give us the latest and most current state of play um, on the nuclear negotiations, if you may. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Nagar. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Peterson Institute uh, for the invitation. It's great to be here. Um, now, to give you an update uh, on, on the state of play in negotiations, basically they're in suspended animation, and that's where they have been for the past uh, three and a half months. Uh, but this week, actually, there's a lot uh, happening on the diplomatic front. Uh, the uh, chief negotiator on the European side, uh, Enrique Mora, is going to Tehran tomorrow uh, to meet with uh, his new Iranian counterpart, uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Ali Bagheri, uh, to discuss, uh, first of all, when Iran is coming back to the negotiating table, and then whether Iran is willing to start the negotiations, uh, basically pick up the talks from where uh, the Rouhani administration left them off on June 20th, uh, after six rounds of talks uh, in Vienna. Uh, now, uh, the expectation is that Iran will come back to the table in uh, November, uh, more likely early or mid-November uh, rather than late November. And that's uh, for another reason, which is that the Board of Governors of the IAEA will have another meeting uh, towards the end of November. And if uh, indeed there is no progress on uh, JCPOA talks or Iran's cooperation with the agency on uh, giving access to the inspectors or 
answering some of the outstanding questions that, uh, that the IAEA has about Iran's past nuclear activities. There is a possibility that there would be a censure resolution uh, uh, in, in the Board of Governors, uh, which uh, is something that Iran has warned against, and it's, it's a possibility that it would derail the negotiations. So everybody would prefer to avoid that, but uh, I think some uh, people need some justification to further kick this can down the road, and that's why the negotiations would have to begin, I think, uh, at some point in November. Now, even if the Iranians pick up from where the, uh, the previous administration left off, uh, the expectation is that these talks are going to be extremely difficult because remember, even in June, both sides were already at a deadlock. Uh, there are some serious differences that remain between Iran and the US. I would put them on in four uh, uh, buckets uh, that I, I, I would generalize them in this way and I'll be very brief. One is the question of sanctions. Uh, the uh, Trump administration not only reimposed the sanctions that were left at, uh, uh, as a result of the JCPOA's conclusion, but also imposed an almost equal number of new uh, or relabeled sanctions. Uh, and the Biden administration's view is that some of these sanctions are not inconsistent with the JCPOA and wants to keep uh, about 450, 500 of them out of the 1600 uh, that are currently in place. And that is something that the Iranians uh, are pushing back against. Uh, the second bucket of issues are some of the nuclear measures that uh, the West expects Iran to take to uh, basically restore some of the non-proliferation uh, threshold that, uh, that the JCPOA had put in place, including the one year breakout time, which is the amount of time that it takes for Iran to accumulate enough fissile material for a single nuclear weapon. And that requires the kind of technical work that the Iranians are a bit reluctant to do. The uh, third bucket of issues are related to Iran's demand for guarantees that the US would no longer uh, undermine sanctions relief or renege on the agreement in the future. Uh, and although it sounds like a reasonable demand, unfortunately, there are not a lot of legal mechanisms that the US can provide uh, to guarantee long-term survival of the JCPOA. Uh, and finally, it's the U US demand that Iran commit uh, to follow on negotiations one, once the JCPOA is restored uh, in order to uh, basically agree to a longer and stronger nuclear deal or in other words, a better, a better deal for both sides. And if the, if the parties go back to the table with the same degree of uh, uh, flexibility that they had back in June, uh, I think the outcome is not going to be fundamentally different. Um, so the hope is that the Iranians, if they come back to the table insisting on few of the red lines that they had in mind, uh, a few mon months ago, at least are willing to demonstrate flexibility on some other issues, which could then potentially be matched with US flexibility on some issues and uh, at least US meeting some of its uh, key objectives. Uh, and that way the JCPOA uh, could be restored. But again, it's a big if, uh, and, and these talks could get dragged on well into 2022. Thank you, Ali. Interestingly, you also had a piece together with Valley recently in September in Foreign Affairs magazine, where you basically both of you discuss um, the way how to save the Iran nuclear deal and mainly emphasize that both sides, Tehran and Washington, must revise their red lines or risk war. So I want to turn to Valley and maybe take a step back, sort of a bird's eye view, because many Iran watchers, myself included, um, in Washington and beyond, expected the revival of the JCPOA to happen earlier and, and easier, frankly, when the Biden administration came into office in January. And while the moderates were still in power, the Rouhani administration, the Zarif team who uh, negotiated the JCPOA with some of the people who are actually in the Biden administration right now, there was this expectation that this revival is something that can be done fast and, and fairly uh, smoothly. And that didn't happen. Um, and that basically brought us to the point where now that the Biden administration will have to be dealing with a more hardline administration in Tehran with more hardline and, uh, and frankly difficult uh, demands when it comes to their negotiation style and also their outlook on this whole um, um, policy. Can you discuss um, why we are where we are, how this happened, and basically how you see the path going forward as you want that both sides need to revise the red lines. 
Well, uh, thank you, uh, Negar, and, and also thanks to Peterson Institute for including me in this uh, panel and in this event. Um, you know, we could look back and, and, uh, and at, at uh, the period between January and now and, and, and think that there might have been possibilities of, of things moving in a different direction. But I don't think it would have been substantially different. I mean, first of all, the two sides were coming back to the idea of rejoining JCPOA uh, with, with a trust deficit between them. Uh, uh, the United States had, had left the deal. Uh, Iran, as a result, was, was very skittish about what does the US return to the deal mean. It was worried that uh, uh, had, if the United States came back to the deal very easily, that he could rally the Europeans much more, uh, much more readily against Iran. Some of the things the US had left on the table, leaving the deal, for instance, which we saw uh, uh, unfold uh, uh, at the United Nations in September of last year when Secretary Pompeo failed uh, to get a, a consensus over Iran's uh, overlifting of sanctions on Iran's pur purchase of uh, weapons and sale of weapons may not be easier if the United States came back to the deal. So as a result, the Iranians wanted certain guarantees, which is still on the table. They also wanted uh, essentially to go back to 2017 uh, uh, to the status quo ante. The United States for its part had, had its own worries. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, the U.S. was was worried that the, the time period of the Trump administration was wasted years, the time that you should have built trust and you should have prepared the ground for follow on negotiations was lost. And going back to JCPOA uh, uh, as and, and then going back to 2017 essentially was not enough because some of the, what worries the United States in terms of sunset clauses was going to come to you in 2023. Uh, time under President Biden's watch. And if you lifted sanctions on Iran, there virtually was no incentive for the two sides to go back, uh, for Iran to have follow on negotiations. I think whereas the Iranians perhaps wanted the revival of JCPOA, the US was already thinking about uh, uh, what it eventually termed a longer and stronger deal from the get go. But, you know, add to everything that Ali said, which was there from the beginning. Uh, I, I would add two things. I think the, the Biden administration perhaps made a mistake of not at least taking some steps in trust building very quickly when it came in the office and essentially waited on, the, uh, on, the, on, on giving any signal about going back or, or, or creating negotiations. That I think gave Iran a sense that it needed to build leverage to make the United States take, take the Iran, Iran nu nuclear deal more seriously. And then that put the two countries on a negative path uh, from which they haven't been able uh, to get off. Then there is also the domestic uh, issues. In the United States, the reality was, the, is, was this and it still is, that the president faces a 50-50 Senate. He may have won the Senate much bigger. Uh, he may have won the House much bigger, but he came in January 20th uh, facing a domestic reality that was different than the reality that he may have thought during the campaign. And the 50-50 Senate means that uh, a foreign policy sh issue like Iran that has bipartisan opposition to it, puts pressure on the administration in terms of what it can do with on, it, on its own domestic policy. In other words, if you're trying to get an infrastructure bill and every Democratic senator counts, there are some senators who then would have certain veto power on, on some certain foreign policy issues. And I think uh, uh, the administration decided that it was not going to spend political campaign early on, on on an unpopular nuclear deal with Iran uh, and not take any risks. And therefore, it thought that it can wait. Uh, it, it, can, it, can, it can let the Iranians stew in the maximum pressure stew for longer. On the other side, you might say that Iran was also inevitably moving towards an election. And that the incent there were there were the conservatives or those who now have taken power in Iran were not highly incentivized to to help uh, President Rouhani salvage his legacy with with JCPOA, get sanctions lifted, uh, perhaps breathe some more uh, life into the moderates in Iran. Even if they lost the presidential election, they may have uh, stayed the course uh, as as a political movement in Iran. And so I think. You know, these factors came together. It's, it's, its timing was not on the side of, of, uh, of JCPOA's quick revival. And, and, and the 
broader domestic sets of issues in the United States did not favor it either. I mean, you know, these foreign policy issues cannot cannot be resolved as if they are suspended outside of the political context in which they have to be dealt with. And I think with to Ali's point, uh, it may very well be that this is such a difficult issue now for the administration that it makes sense to you know, not rush into doing it and to find some means to manage this until uh, 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 when, when the domestic scene may be more favorable or the administration doesn't have to worry about the Senate and Congress in order to deal with. Thank you, Vali. Um, let me go to Puya. Um, Puya, you watch Iran's domestic space very closely. And the, as Vali was explaining, the domestic scene here in Washington, in the United States, there's also domestic politics happening in Tehran. As I mentioned, there's been a change of administration, a change of the faction that's in power in Tehran. And I want to ask you how uh, these dynamics are affecting basically what's the difference between the outlook of the previous administration, the moderate Rouhani team, and the current administration of Ibrahim Raisi, which com comes from the from a very conservative faction of the hardliners, very vocally opposed to the JCPOA, to negotiations with the United States, um, um, sort of constantly following this line that Iran um, gave too much when it came to concessions and received uh, too little. How do you, uh, how can you explain these dynamics in, in the country and also moving forward when it comes to the outlook for the potential revival of the JCPOA or not? Oh, okay. Hello, everybody. Um, and uh, special greetings to the panelists and the Pearson Institute. Um, the, the point that I actually want to make, and if I, if I do have time, I'd, I'd like to kind of address your question, Megar. But the point I wanted to make was to kind of piggyback on what um, Vali and Ali said about um, the sanctions and the effects of them. Um, Ali brought up a really good point about the fact that um, the, the hardline faction in the United States, the Trump administration, and it's okay to call it the hardline faction, by the way, uh, imposed about what 1600 um, sanctions and then the Biden administration is um, okay to keep maybe 450 to 500 of those sanctions in place and then um, Professor Nass mentioned about how that may be because the Biden administration does not want to spend the political capital it's going to cost to remove those sanctions and that's th those remaining 450 or 500 and, that, and that's really the point of those additional sanctions that are unrelated to the JC, JCPOA and the Iran nuclear program. Um, and if you look, if you really pay attention uh, anywhere, even on Twitter, the big proponents of all the sanctions, including the additional non-nuclear related sanctions are really designed to make, when they were first imp implemented a few years ago by the hardline faction in the United States, the whole point was really to prevent a Biden administration return to the JCPOA. Right. So this whole sanctions regime was done or imposed by the Trump administration, not only to subvert the JCPOA, but to ensure that a future Democratic um, president would not be able to return to them. Uh, and then if you take that now and then you, you look at it from the Iranian perspective, the idea is that not only did we concede too much, but we we got no guarantees in return and um, the Biden administration at the end of the day is still, um, no matter what he said on the campaign trail, and that's always the thing, right? The candidates always say something on the campaign trail and then they say something great, they do something very different when they come to office. And we had this with uh, President Trump as well. Candidate Trump talked about Saudi Arabia and 9-11, and then President Trump went and signed a $110 billion um, arms agreement with the Saudis in his first trip abroad. And so the Biden administration, uh, or candidate Biden said one thing, President Biden now is, uh, as Professor Nas said, not keen to spend the political capital and remove all the sanctions, even though it was the United States that first subverted the Iran nuclear deal. Iran abided by it by a full year, um, even after the US subversion. And um, still, there is no real movement on the United States um, to um, help to restore this nuclear agreement. And, and the onus still is on the United States basically telling the Iranians that they're the ones that have to come into um, uh, basically adherence first and foremost. And, and the flip side to that is that the Iranians really feel like um, there's, no, there's no point in negotiating, I think. Uh, they want the sanctions removed. They're willing to come back 
and to compliance, but they don't really see that as, as a viable um, you know, future trajectory, especially since the, the Biden administration won't remove all the sanctions. They already know that and um, expects the Iranians to give up more. And that trust deficit is huge. And I would say while the people are the ones who are suffering most under the US sanctions, no matter what the government says here in the United States, the sanctions are first and foremost affecting the people, right? Because it's targeting the Iranian economy that feeds 83 to 84 million people. Um, the, the people do want the sanctions removed, but I really don't, you know, every, every day that goes by, I'm losing kind of my optimism as to how viable that, that prospect really is. Thank you, Priya. Um, let me go to Mahsa next. Mahsa, you know you have. I know you have also have an eye on the region um, when it comes to this whole nuclear issue, because it's not just Iran in the United States. It's also U.S. allies across the region um, who have a stake in these negotiations and eventually the nuclear deal or or a, a different deal, a new deal, as uh, we're starting to hear. Can you give us a um, uh, overview of how Iran's regional rivals are seeing the current process with the Biden administration. There's a new government in Israel. They have a different relationship with the Biden administration than the previous uh, Israeli government did with the Obama administration and also the Trump. And um, there's also talks between Iran and Saudi Arabia that seem to be moving forward with the US trying to disengage from the Middle East. All of these are dynamics in the region that affect US-Iran negotiations and the JCPOA. So let's hear from Massa if you can give us your thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you, Nagarjan. Thanks uh, to the Pearson Institute for inviting me. It's an honor to be on this panel. Um, just a quick disclaimer that uh, the views that I share today are my personal views and uh, do not represent the views of National Defense University. Um, Nagarjan, I think we are one question behind you uh, a little bit, but I want to just follow up uh, on, on what Puya um, uh, said about the, the prospects and the outlook for the JCPOA, and I share uh, his, his pessimism, but I wanted to raise a couple of comments on that, and then that gets me um, to your question about the region. Um, so as, as, as Puya mentioned, I think this idea that the Iranians felt the the basically there is not much hope for prospects of proper sanctions relief and as well as what they call it verifications for the sanctions. So um, that I think started uh, as the rounds of talks were concluding in June and I think you know, in my view, the the the, the way the election uh, went in Iran, as as all of you were uh, sort of looking at it, the, the 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 key foreign policy and security appointments ever since, are all pointing um, or, or signaling that there is not much expectation that there will be any meaningful uh, rapprochement and engagement with the West, with with the Europeans or, or or the Americans, and I think everything points to that, and I do think there has been that conclusion because the the, the demand. Demands of, of, of the Iranians are so much diverging from what they, they understand is feasible on, on the American side uh, to provide. And while that's very disappointing, I think it's important to sort of keep that in mind because we might be uh, we might be heading towards um, a, a very rough sort of uh, security spiral and uh, escalation cycle between um, the U.S. and Iran. As a result of that, uh, Iranians uh, have in various forms or shapes, the Supreme Leader's Office, that the Parliament recently put out a report, have emphasized on the need for verification mechanisms, similar to what the JCPOA provides for the nuclear steps that Iran is taking for the economic benefits that Iran would um, reap. And it, it seems, uh, it, it, this seems like an impossible task. This is something that I work on, and I hope that there are some solutions to this in the future. But at the moment, the prospect for it is, is not very um, it is not very bright, and so that's I think uh, that that's I think really important. And putting that then into the context of if that were to be the case, and really the the, the demands and the expectations are so diverging, uh, as um, Iran, whether it joined the talks in in, in early November or, or mid November, etc., as the talks resume. Um, 
you know, it, it would be just sort of the, uh, uh, this, we are, we are hitting that deadlock or, or stalemate and we continue that, but that's not a sustainable strategy because Iran continues to build on its nuclear program. So at some point, this escalation uh, might trigger uh, either an airstrike by the Israelis or it moves towards sort of a military confrontation, which is already in several arenas are sort of as, as, as a proxy confrontation happening between Iran and Israel. And so I, I, while, and again, sort of this gets back to the, to the question of the region where I think it's actually um, what the future of the talks in the region, whether between Iran and Saudi Arabia or the future of potential conflict between Iran and Israel is highly dependent on the future of the nuclear talks, right? So uh, while they're ongoing and they seem to have promise, and it's it's uh, it's always better uh, that uh, rivals talk than not talk. Um, whether they actually lead to again sort of uh, meaningful understandings uh, in, in in the future, uh, I think that highly depends on whether Iran enters a, a, a sort of a, a, an escalatory cycle with the U.S. or not. And that highly depends on the nuclear issue. Thank you, Max. So let me go back to Ali. Um, we mentioned the follow-on talks. It's something that the Biden administration had um, publicly said and had hoped for to basically be able to uh, go beyond just Iran's nuclear program and uh, discuss other issues. Iranians also have been, um, as Massa mentioned and others, uh, talking about demands that are beyond the nuclear issue. Um, simultaneously, there's also the issue of dual national prisoners. There are a number of um, Iranian Americans, Iranian Europeans that are have been detained in Iran, some for a very long time, and uh, their fate uh, sort of also has been entangled with the future of the, of the JCPOA or these nuclear talks. Can you talk about some of these other issues, if you really see a possibility for um, any agreement between Tehran and Washington, whether it be a more for more or just a new set of um, compliance for compliance and also on these other issues, um, including the uh, fate of the new national pr uh, prisoners? Sure, uh, that's a good question. Uh, look, first of all, um, I, my understanding is that the Biden administration's uh, vision of a longer and stronger nuclear deal uh, is primarily focused on a purely nuclear deal. Um, remember that the, not only the US had some dissatisfaction with some of the measures in the JCPOA, and there was a lot of debate in this country about sunsets, for, for instance, among other, other issues. Some, some uh, exaggerated and, and some real uh, dissatisfaction. And there was also dissatisfaction on the Iranian side uh, on uh, sanctions relief. Uh, remember in 2016, even with uh, Secretary Kerry going around the world trying to encourage uh, banks and companies to invest in Iran, work in Iran, uh, there was still a, a significant degree of reluctance because the, the sanctions chilling effect had outlived uh, the, the executive orders that, uh, that, that were withdrawn uh, from, from President Obama, uh, by President Obama. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I think the experience of the past four years, and by the way, today is the fourth anniversary of President Trump starting the process of unraveling the JCPOA by decertifying uh, Iran's compliance. Uh, the experience of the past four years has clearly demonstrated that this deal is not stable. Uh, and so I don't think it's unreasonable for either side uh, to want a better for better kind of arrangement when it gets to the nuclear issue. Uh, both uh, more nuclear uh, uh, measures that the U.S. is seeking and also more sanctions relief that, they, that the Iranians are seeking. And by the way, that's also what Iran has brought up in the sixth round of talks in Vienna, some of the things that they want really go beyond the, the, the framework of the JCPOA, uh, like you know U-turn transactions or access to the US financial system in order to normalize Iran's banking relations, uh, even the question of guarantees. Uh, these are things that really go beyond the JCPOA. And so it's uh, you know, hard to understand uh, Iran's reluctance uh, to engage in, in these talks, especially because the commitment that the Biden administration was seeking was not was not conditional, was not time bound. So there would have been no consequence if 
for instance, in six months or a year or two years, they would not have uh, achieved any kind of agreement. Uh, my understanding is that the Biden administration's vision for a uh, for addressing uh, uh, some other issues like Iran's uh, regional activities or uh, its ballistic missile program is not within the P5 plus one structure. Uh, look, the P5 plus one was created by and was mandated by the UN Security Council in order to tackle a specific issue, and that was Iran's nuclear program. Its membership is also limited. How can you discuss the region behind the back of regional countries who are not at the table? Uh, and so it's really not possible uh, to address any of those issues. Uh, but in the bilateral discussions that Iran has with its neighbors, uh, with Saudi I think we lost Ali, so um, we can yes, continue the discussion. Can you are you me? still on? I can hear you. I don't see you though. Let me, um, Alijan, let me move to Valley uh, and then I'll come back to you when I can see you and hear you properly. Um, Valley, we also uh, are expecting or basically seeing sort of a shift to the east when it comes to Iran's uh, direction of foreign policy towards China, Russia, both economically, politically, diplomatically, and um, I also, I, I want you to first talk about this shift to the East, especially with the new hardline and more conservative and anti-American um, faction in power in Iran and not just the administration, the hardliners also took over the parliament last year. And if you could also comment um, on Afghanistan specifically after the US withdrawal, if you see any opening um, for potential collaboration or an international um way of working together between iran and the europeans or even tehran and washington um with the withdrawal of the u.s forces from afghanistan and and the current refugee crisis in the country thank you i, I mean the issue of uh, uh, iran's looking uh, to to the east is is, is a broad is, is a very important strategic debate in iran it went to the heart of president rohani's initial uh, desire to to have the nuclear deal because I think uh, his his view of Iran's foreign policy uh, and that of his foreign minister uh, Javad Zarif was that in order for Iran to be neutral, it had to have an anchor in its relations with the West, and that uh, and that anchor uh, uh, would be facilitated by a nuclear deal that would remove a very important uh, obstacle to relations, but also bring business and economic ties. The failure of JCPOA in Iran, and I have to say that 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 the that the, the 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 opponents of President Rouhani, and also many among Iran's conservatives, uh, all the way from the supreme leader down to uh, various conservative factions, were were highly suspicious of getting closer to Europe and the United States. And even if they may want a transactional uh, lifting of sanctions, they don't want better ties. Uh, and even as Iran was starting to negotiate the nuclear deal, uh, the elements of the revolutionary guards were getting closer and closer to, to, to Russia. And, and this was also facilitated by the entire Syria war. And, uh, and at, at the beginning, it was Russia where sort of would be the strategic anchor for Iran. China came on the scene a bit later. I, I, I think the collapse of JCPOA uh, dealt a heavy blow to this idea that Iran would try to be equidistant between East and West, and that it could have an anchor to, in Europe and the United States that could keep it away from drifting East. And in fact, the collapse of JCPOA made Iran more reliant on the East. I mean, China is right now perhaps singularly responsible for, flow, for keeping Iran's economy afloat through uh, manufacturing deals, as well as purchasing Iran's, uh, Iran's oil enough to keep the economy survive under maximum pressure. So, so this issue of looking east, whether it's feasible or not, is very closely tied to what happened to JCPOA. Now, the question is, what is the limit? Because rhetorically, it's easy to say we're going to look east. But Iranians also have certain difficulties in dealing with China. I mean, a, a big strategic partnership with China would also hit the same sanctions wall uh, that Iran is, 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 hasn't been able to lift. Uh, the same set of issues uh, uh, that, that prevent Western companies from coming to Iran could also prevent some Chinese companies. Iranians don't like foreign debt. It's, Iran is the only country 
perhaps in, in its middle income country that has no foreign debt. Uh, Chinese investments in most of the Belt and Road are leverage based. A lot of Iranians are uncomfortable with that. But so so the, we're seeing that drift, but I'm not sure that Iran may end up going as far as let's say Pakistan has gone uh, with China. But and, and, and the nuclear deal of sorts still in play. And on the other hand, US-China relations are not where they were in 2015. You know, there's a number of moving parts here. And this is tied to Afghanistan. You know, I think the Chinese, the Russians, the Iranians, they all saw the Taliban victory in Afghanistan coming. In fact, Iran's foreign minister, Javad Zarif, said at the beginning of the Doha talks, said that uh, the United States has given Afghanistan to the Taliban. The question was how quickly would this happen and what would be the terms of a final settlement? So the, the way it happened was perhaps the worst as far as Iran was concerned. And as the Taliban took Kabul without uh, 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 any, any kind of a compromise, uh, and, and even though Iran had engaged them diplomatically, it was not really able to completely influence how they might set up their own government. Other sources of resistance, particularly in the Panjshir Valley by the Tajiks collapsed very quickly. All the governorates of Northern Afghanistan who were very close to Iran, they all escaped. Uh, uh, or, or Ismail Khan, the governor of Herat, escaped to Iran. So essentially, the Taliban took over uh, without any impediment. Iran is, uh, is now facing a major refugee crisis, which is going to get worse when the Afghan economy completely tanks. It's looking at an, at an increase in drug trade, and is also extremely worried about ISIS setting shop in Afghanistan, and, and it's also very worried about a, a sectarian civil war in Afghanistan. So the, so the massive bombing that we saw in a, in a Shia mosque in Kunduz that killed 80 plus Afghans is a sort of a warning sign of what, what things might come. So Iran has, has a lot on its own to worry about Afghanistan, but it, it visits on the broader issue. So there are some, some things that have happened that are key. One is that the United States did leave Afghanistan. And, and that uh, in, the, in the rhetoric of a country that sees the biggest revenge for General Soleimani's killing to be to force the U.S. out of the region is a very important milestone. To them, it, ha it, it plays into the leverage about questions about the region. Secondly, most of Iran's regional uh, rivals, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, etc., also were extremely worried about the way the United States left Afghanistan. Uh, because again, the the, it's very clear that the U.S. might leave. And, and that puts Iraq into play, particularly now that Muqtada Sadr has done extremely well and Sadr is favorable to the United States leaving. The question is how long will the United States remain in, in Iraq, which is the other country Iran cares about a, a great deal. And, and so, the, so the lay of the land has uh, in some ways uh, uh, completely changed. It also puts to question what to expect of the American administration. The, the, the criticism of the Afghan withdrawal was so severe in, in the United States, even though relatively short-lived, that you have to wonder whether the, United, whether the Biden administration is willing and, and right now capable of dealing with another major foreign policy issue that's going to invite a huge amount of criticism. And I think that's what puts more pressure on Biden to say that, that the fact that he cannot go to the American people unless he can claim that this deal with Iran out of Vienna is Ben JCPOA. Because if he says it's the same deal, uh, the blowback would be quite severe and it'd be a repeat of what they went through with Afghanistan. On the other hand, uh, uh, you might say that, that uh, uh, the, the pressures may actually play in favor of uh, Biden biting the bullet and, and, and uh, trying to resolve uh, uh, this big crisis that may come in a different way. In other words, if, if Vienna talks collapse, what's going to happen next? Iran is going to march to being one screwdriver short of a bomb, in which case the US will be forced into going back into the region. So, so how this plays out, I think, is, is something is on the Iranian minds. I mean, how do you, re how do you read the impact of Afghanistan on the mindset uh, of, of the administration. And then uh, I, I would say uh, for Iran, um, uh, the chaos in Afghanistan is real. It's also real for China. It's real for Russia. It's real for Uzbekistan. All of them think that the United States cut and run, left a huge mess that, that, that they have to now deal with. So they also now, in a real way, do have a common ground to work with. In other words, the Iranians need the Chinese, the Chinese need the Iranians, both of them need the Russians, 
in order to stabilize Afghanistan. It's now their joint mess. And that basically provides a basis for them to actually collaborate. So some of this shift to the East now is at a practical level about management of the region without, without the United States. And, uh, and, that, and that's, you know, uh, in some ways, you know, the, Iran's admissions in, into the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, whether Iran gets anything out of it or doesn't get anything out of it, symbolically is really about China understanding that it needs Iran and Russia to manage this region and Iran needs them to manage the region. So Afghanistan basically is, ha, has helped this uh, move east from rhetoric to some practica, practical level. Thank you, Valley. Ali, we have you back. If you can just briefly wrap up that thought, we lost you somewhere in the middle. Sure, my apologies for the technical issue. Um, so as I was saying, I, I don't think the US vision is uh, to have regional discussions within the framework of the P5 plus one or even discussions about Iran's missile program. Those have to be addressed in regional frameworks because it's a question of balance of power, it's a question of threat perceptions, uh, and they're much better uh, fit for an inclusive uh, regional dialogue than for either bilateral discussions between Iran and the US or within the P5 plus one. The question of dual nationals and detainees uh, is, is a separate issue, which was there was some linkage during the Vienna process because, uh, you know, these talks were happening in Vienna uh, and Iran's chief negotiator Abbas Arachi at the time was empowered to discuss uh, those, issue, uh, those issues with uh, his British counterparts who were uh, basically uh, mediating on behalf of the US and also to, to uh, discuss the release of their own uh, detainees. Uh, and because the Vienna process uh, was put on hold, uh, that process also stopped. Uh, I think now uh, the US is prepared uh, to have a, a separate discussion about the fate of the prisoners. Uh, this is a question uh, of fate of human beings. Uh, you know, today actually is a very sad milestone because uh, it's the sixth anniversary of the arrest of my dear friend Siamak Namazi. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's no reason for these two issues to be linked. Uh, and um, I, I know that, uh, you know, at least uh, the Biden administration is prepared uh, to resume those discussions directly, indirectly, in however way that the Iranians are willing to engage uh, in order to uh, end this ordeal uh, for individuals uh, that most of them, uh, I would say, uh, are held on bogus charges. Thank you, Ali. Moving to Massa. Massa, I'd like to get your thoughts on the move to the east, um, but with the, especially with the new administration in Tehran. And I also want to pose one of the audience questions to you, if you can take both of these. The question is, if the JCPOA talks don't go through, how can international aid be extended to the Iranian people through a human rights or a humanitarian framework, perhaps through European actors? if you can um, discuss this as well. Thank you. Um, sure, Nagarjun. So first on the, on, on the look towards East, I just, you know, Vali painted the perfect uh, sort of um, scenarios on sort of how uh, Iranians are gonna move towards and what sort of uh, triggers this move towards East and, and the Afghanistan issue. I'll just add a couple of quick points um, to, to the picture that you painted. One is that, as again, we are moving towards the, the resumption of the talks and, and the future of the talks, I think this would highly depend then on Russia and China and how they are able to either offer incentives or pressure Iran uh, into sort of conceding or, or, or uh, stepping back some of their demands because with the extent of sanctions that are already existing from the Europeans and the American side, I think it, it you know, as, as, as Valim mentioned, Iran is really more so dependent on a variety of different issues, not just economy. Um, or relies on, I should say, dependent on, on Russia and China. And so they will be really in, in the position of, uh, you know, making, uh, impacting the talks and the future of the talks. And unfortunately, I don't think that they are where they were prior to when the JCPOA came to place in the sense that I don't think 
or anywhere close to setting red lines or pressuring Iran um, in, into resumption of the talks or into making additional sort of concessions, et cetera. So I think that's something to keep in mind. And uh, it, it, it's definitely a, a, a centerpiece of, of Raisi's sort of foreign policy to focus on the relations with these, with these two countries and Asia and Central Asia in general. On Afghanistan, I raised one point. Um, uh, adding to everything that uh, I agree with and, and, and Valley mentioned, which is I worry that the one of the lessons that the Iranians might draw from the situation is that now the US is in a very difficult position and the least likely to engage in another military conflict in the region. And that gives them a particular uh, confidence that they they really accelerate their their nuclear program and sort of in with with this sort of assumption that they can use this or seize this opportunity um, and and move faster on their nuclear program. So that's sort of one one lesson from the Afghanistan on the humanitarian issue. If the talks fail, first of all, I don't know what would the failure of the talks or the JCPOA being dead uh, looks like yet because it, you know. Uh, it, it, things might just, the, the talks might pause again, and but there's still a JCPOA, but it's really not nothing in practice, it's just a name. Um, but I, from, from, from the mood that I understand from the Europeans, I highly doubt if there is no prospect or if they realize at any point that there is no prospect of reviving the JCPOA, that they would be willing to um, engage in any kind of transactions, even when they highly supported the JCPOA and wanted to help Iran, they were unable to do much on, on, on that front because of the difficulties and the complexities around the sanctions. So, and, and add that to um, the, the human rights background of President Raisi, and the fact that Iran will more likely do even more crackdowns, and so the human rights violations will potentially even increase in the future, I think the Europeans would be less likely to engage in any kind of financial transaction dealing even under humanitarian. So unfortunately, uh, like ever, the, 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 the people will be um, uh, taking most of the hit and, and suffer most uh, in, in, in this scenario if the talks fail. Thank you, Masa. Moving on to Puya. Puya, I'd like to also get your thoughts on the Iran's potential shift to the east. And then um, if you can also talk about the domestic scene a little bit in the country, the country is under very intense crippling sanctions, basically the economy. Um, Iran is also dealing with COVID. It's been the epicenter um, of the virus in the Middle East. Um, there's also corruption and mismanagement within the country. The um, state has been dealing with multiple past and ongoing crises, the deadly suppression of any form of dissent and protest starting in November 2019. Um, with very little accountability, the shooting down of the Ukrainian passenger plane, the subsequent cover up or the attempt to cover up of that incident. These are all very vivid and alive in the psyche of the, of the society. And I'd like you to comment on how much of a challenge these domestic crises are for Iran when also uh, viewing the, the foreign policy issues they're dealing with. And if you think they're an existential uh, threat to the Islamic Republic. Um, okay, so I had to write this down. I, I don't know if I'm going to get to all your points. I'm going to do my best. Um, but basically, I think when we're talking about the shift to the East, it, it's important to, to talk about in the context of the Iran nuclear deal. Um, and really, what it, comes, what it really comes down to now is that the Iran nuclear deal is the party of one. And that's really the Iranians, right? So the, Europe, the, the U.S. has more or less left the agreement, sanctioned Iran to the brim, and the Europeans haven't been able to fulfill their end of the bargain um, to basically provide sanctions relief. And so there's a good cop, bad cop situation where the sanctions are in place and then the Europeans are trying to urge the Iranians to stay compliant. And no one's, and, and then Iran on the other hand is being sanctioned and it's being demanded to remain compliant. And, and so that's what I mean when I say it's the party of one, uh, that one being Iran. And that could kind of explain the shift to the East, to China, um, which, which in my opinion as a historian is a historical. If you look at the past couple hundred years of Iranian history, especially when it comes to um, the monarchy and the monarchs, not just the Pahlavis, but the previous monarchs, 
the Bajars, they, they historically looked to the West, uh, Western Europe and the United States and um, I Iranians themselves. Uh, I don't want to generalize 84 million people, but let's just say segments of, of Iranian society have also looked to the West. Um, uh, Mahmoud Azhar Shah himself uh, studied in Europe. Dr. Mossadegh, the democratically elected leader that was overthrown by the United States and the British, he had studied in um, Switzerland and, and France. Uh, when when my parents left Iran in 1983, we didn't think about going to China. We we came to the United States, and so the government itself, uh, even Iran's documents, like its constitution, was largely French and and. Uh, and Belgian, you know, from 120 years ago. So it's political inspiration in large part before the Islamic revolution came from the West. And I would say that a lot of leadership, the whole point of the JCPOA was to establish a better relationship with Western countries, Western European and, and, and the United States. Um, and when that didn't happen, there has been this shift to the East, even though it was the, Iran and China have had relations for a long time, but it's be, it's become much more intense because China is one of those sole countries that is helping Iran skirt the sanctions. And so there's kind of this dichotomy now where still large segments of the population population is looking westward. You know, they want to come to the United States or Europe to study um, and, and they very much consume Western culture. And again, I don't want to generalize the entire population, but now the government is looking eastward. So there's this dichotomy, it's a little bit ahistorical as well. Um, and I think, again, that's a product of the JCPOA. Uh, if I may quickly talk about um, uh, Iran and Afghanistan, really briefly, um, uh, Professor Nas mentioned this when it came to Ismail Khan. When Ismail Khan, he's a, a veteran of the uh, uh, Afghan Jihad against the Soviets, uh, he's a Shiite Muslim. Um, had he been captured by the Taliban in the late 90s, uh, he probably would have been executed. Uh, this is the same Taliban that worked with Al Qaeda to assassinate Ahmed Shah Massoud uh, in 2001. Um, so the Taliban really are keen to eliminate their military challengers. And Ismail Khan, as a you know essentially a, a, a veteran of war or a warlord, uh, could be seen as a threat too. And when when the Taliban captured him, uh, when they were basically on the march taking over the country, and breakneck breakneck speed, we all thought he was he was doomed. And all of a sudden, a day later, he shows up in the Iranian eastern city of Mashhad. And to us, that, that or at least to me, it was a huge surprise that he survived and he wasn't killed. But that, to me, kind of uh, meant that the Iranians um, helped facilitate his release. He didn't escape. He was released to the Iranians, in my opinion. And the idea really is that, and this is what, what terrified the Saudis and the Amaratis and the Bahrainis, is that the Iranians knew at the end of the day that however diametrically they opposed they have been to the Taliban, they knew that the U.S. would one day withdraw from Afghanistan and that the Taliban was likely going to be the future of, Afghan, of, of, of Afghanistan. And the idea was that if they're going to be the future and the United States is not the future of Afghanistan, then we should probably establish ties with the, with the Taliban years before um, their, their seizure of Kabul. And, and that's really kind of what scares, I think, the Emiratis and the Saudis is that the United States will one day leave the Middle East. And, and that's, that's the real fear. Not, it's probably the manner in which the United States left Afghanistan, but the fact that they are not a Middle Eastern power. They may be currently the dominant Middle Eastern power in the country, in the region, with their bases and their interventions and their arms packages to, to various countries in the region. But at the end of the day, they're not a, an indigenous military force and they will one day withdraw from the region. That's the thing that I think scares the Emiratis and the Saudis who have banked on the United States to provide their security. Uh, in terms of protests in Iran, um, if, I'm, if I'm supposed to stay on the topic, if it's okay, um, I think really the point of the sanctions on Iran wasn't necessarily to achieve a better deal. I don't think anyone in DC um, was under any illusion that the sanctions or subverting the JCPOA would make the Iranians give the United States more in terms of a future deal. I don't think anyone really actually thought that. I think the point was to sanction Iran, either to keep Iran back or to help the country implode, right? So that people would be hit so hard in their pocketbooks that they will demonstrate against the Iranian government and either the, the Iranian government would fall or the Iranian government would crack down as it has in the past 
and that would polarize and fracture society. And so some, as somebody who uh, you know, spent years studying the Green Movement in 2009, uh, the Iranian government was harsh towards the Green Movement, but nothing compared to what happened in um, November of 2019 and, and subsequent demonstrations, especially in the context of, of sanctions. And that's really been the point. So when COVID hit Iran, uh, and Iran was the epicenter of the virus in the Middle East, um, the United States didn't provide sanctions relief, even though that's been the custom of countries who are at odds with each other. When there's a natural disaster or an emergency type situation, they put aside their um, animosities for temporary humanitarian relief. The Trump administration not only did not do that, do that but it saw COVID as an opportunity to strike Iran or to hit Iran while it was down, and it tightened sanctions on Iran and the population. And really, the goal was, again, to help the country implode, in my opinion. Thank you, Puya. We have about six minutes left. I'd like to pose um, this uh, question to the rest of the panel. Maso, maybe we'll start by you. Um, if you can give your assessment of the domestic situation in Iran, Puya uh, gave a great um, view on how the sanctions are affecting uh, these dynamics. Again, repression by the government, various ongoing anti-government protests. The economic situation, COVID, how much of these crises do you think are a serious existential threat to the Islamic Republic, as some in Washington like to think? And how do you see the country basically moving forward, um, looking both at the domestic scene and also the issue of the nuclear negotiations and the regional talks? Thank you, Nagarjan. Um, just very uh, briefly, so I I'm very pessimistic about the future, particularly domestically, because I, I believe it's already started and it will only get worse with more repression, more securitization, uh, more isolation. And I think, again, going back to the way uh, President Raisi was elected and, and ever since all the appointments, it seems like they they really no longer care about sort of middle class, upper middle class Iranians. They only cater to the loyal support base of the regime, whatever that number of the population or portion of the population that may be, uh, which I'm not sure we have proper stats on it, uh, as well as their support base in the region. And that would mean, I think, that they, they're, they're assessing that um, they are able to, even under sanctions and even with things economic, with the economy worsening, they are able to endure that and their support base is, is able to sort of continue some level uh, of, um, of, of living uh, that they will provide for and that any dissatisfaction or, or, or uh, criticism or uprising uh, that usually sort of the, the, the elites, the upper middle class and middle class in Iran would do um, that they believe they have the capacity to crack down unfortunately and crack down hard. Um, so I, I, I suspect we are we are heading towards even as it has been already, you know, since uh, we mentioned the November uh, crackdowns, I, I think we might witness uh, even sort of worse situations uh, in the years to come, unfortunately. Thank you, Masa. Uh, Vali, if you can also give your thoughts on the domestic situation, if you think there is an existential crisis to the regime and how it will unfold and forward. Uh, I, I agree with both of them. I would say uh, uh, yes and no. In other words, uh, uh, the, 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 the Islamic Republic, whether the worst of maximum pressure and is still standing, it gives them certain degree of confidence. They did it through brutality, as well as the fact that perhaps uh, they, they had safety valves that, that the, the architects of the sanctions did not take into consideration. But uh, you know, at the same time, it's not between black and white that either the regime falls or, or it, it, it is completely uh, it remains intact in the shape that it is. I, I think even the changes that we're seeing towards securitization, towards conservative consol uh, consolidation, these are, these are regime change of kinds that have happened as a consequence of, of, of uh, the strategic environment. But, but, the, but the key issue is this, is that, in my opinion, is that uh, Iran is going towards succession. And, uh, and, and I think uh, there's certain degree of uh, uh, importance that, that there's certain amount of stability, social and economic, when succession happens. Because uh, at that moment, 
uh, you know, things cannot be as predictable for the for the establishment as as it is today. And there is no question that there's po popular unhappiness in Iran. Uh, Iranians are unhappy with where they are, regardless of whether they blame America or they blame uh, the, the clerical elite, they're unhappy. And uh, unhappy populations are unpredictable. And, 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 and it's not a good position for any government to, to be dealing with the kind of mood that we are seeing in Iran. And then I would say that, that, that the, the, there's further unpredictability because we often talk about bread and butter issues. Now there's whether there's medicine, there's bread, there's food on, uh, for people to buy, but, but it, it, Iran is now facing a severe a degradation of its infrastructure because of lack of investment. So there are water shortages, electricity shortages, energy shortages, and those can have unpredictable popular reactions that is not in their playbook. But it's that the uprising in Khuzestan ended up being a major ethnic issue. It was not provoked by daily inflation, it was provoked by major water shortage. And if those things become pervasive, even the base of the regime is gonna be very unhappy and is gonna demand change. And so, so I think you know things are not as stable in Iran as, as it may seem, but they're not also as unstable as the Trump administration had hoped. And that to me gives some degree, gives me some degree of hope because I think there is incentive in Iran to find a way to come to a deal with the United States. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're almost out of time. I want to thank our first of all audience for tuning in today. This panel will also be. Uh, posted online for those who miss and can watch the full panel later on. I want to thank the Pearson Institute for hosting this important panel and the excellent panelists, these top experts who joined me, Mahsa Ruhi, Ali Nasr, Ali Voez, and Puya Ali Makram. Thank you and have a great rest of the day.